duffel down. Uh, please, just because there's pe some people coming in, and uh, it would mean that I know people that you don't know might have to sit beside you, uh, but that is not a terrible thing as it sounds. Can I give a, a special welcome to our friends and family of, of Chris and Alex and, and Rebecca as we um, uh, will be able to, to be part of that baptismal service this morning. It's really great to have you with us. Can I encourage you to hang around afterwards for tea and coffee, uh, a bite to eat as well, um, both out in the hall at the back and the coffee dock area as well. And let me just throw out uh, one announcement before we kick things off regarding uh, Sunday morning children's ministry. Um, we're teaming with kids. It's amazing, uh, but that means that we've had to move some things around. So if you are a kid or responsible for a kid, listen up. If uh, Kids Zone, so that's P1 to P5. You're in the main hall as normal. So that's after the kids song, after the kids children's address, out the hall back. I'll tell you when to go. Uh, senior Sunday school, it's P6 and P7. Uh, upper room, so that's up uh, the stairs at the back of church, the stairs here, P6 and 7. Bible class, that's year 8 and year 9. Youth room, out uh, up the stairs outside the coffee dock. Tot zone, so uh, three and four year olds. Um, they're now in the crash, so that room behind the sound desk. Um, and that starts when uh, children leave for kids' zone. And then there's crash as well, that's for under threes. Um, in the committee room, which is out uh, the back in the hall, or the room off the hall is committee room. Um, you can use that anytime you want if you're a parent, but it will be only, only be supervised uh, from when kids' zone starts. So you can use it, feel free to use that room, but it's not supervised until kids' zone starts. So don't be leaving any kids there until, uh, by themselves until kids' zone starts. And there's also a baby room uh, out the door at the back. Before you get to the hall, there's a room on your right. That's a, a room, uh, if you want to take your baby there, uh, for feeding or changing or whatever you need to do, that's fine. Can I also say, noise doesn't bother us here in Bally Down. So if your kids are making noise, great. I once heard of someone say, if there's no crying, we're dying. So uh, we're, we're love to have noise here. Um, can I encourage you as well, please pray for our leaders as they deal with these uh, number of kids and the, the change in um, rooms. Um, they're doing brilliantly. So please pray for our leaders and for our kids as well. As we come to worship God, let's hear from His Word. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're here to worship God, the God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. And before we sing praises to Him, let's, let's go to Him in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that victory is ours in Christ Jesus. And so this morning, as we meet to worship you and be changed by you, would you give us confidence in him? Would you grow in us an awareness of his loving care for us so that we would live for you? We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Good morning. Um, so I'll do a run through of the songs we're doing this morning. We're doing We Have an Anchor, the new one from last week, and then Only Holy God into Open the Eyes of My Heart. I just want to start by encouraging you for how well you sang last week. The sound from the stage was pretty impressive. Um, so even if you're not into that whole singing in public thing, um, we're all part of this music team together, and it's all for God's glory. So if you'd like to stand, we'll lift our praise offering to him.
have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded permanently in the Savior's love. You have carried us through the raging sea, in the fire and flood we stand. have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll fastened to the rock which cannot move grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love we have an anchor that keeps the soul Steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love.
worship the holy Let's pray. Father, you are the, the holy God. Uh, you are completely without uh, fault, uh, without uh, blemish. Father, there is no imperfection in you. And the angels uh, cry out, holy, holy, holy. And the living creatures around the throne cry out, holy, holy, holy. And Father, uh, none of us may come into your presence uh, because you are holy. Uh, but Father, you have made a way through Jesus who by his uh, blood uh, washes away all our sins. And so Father, we can come. Father, we come in the name of Jesus this morning and we worship you. Father, we do cry out to you that you would uh, cleanse us afresh, Father, that you would pour your spirit into our hearts, Father, and renew us. May we be people who truly reflect our holy God and live holy lives uh, before you, Father. Yes, Father, come and move among us today. Uh, change us uh, by your spirit, we pray, and make us the people that you want us to be in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, this morning, um, Chris and Alex are presenting their daughter, 
Rebecca for uh, baptism. Um, I'll say a few words about baptism first, and then I'll, I'll come down to the front here. What exactly is uh, baptism, and what does it uh, signify? Uh, baptism is a sacrament, and sacraments are signs and seals of the covenant of grace. In Scripture, uh, circumcision is described as a sign of the covenant and a seal of the righteousness that Abraham had by faith. What circumcision was in the old covenant, baptism is in the new. Both symbolize repentance, they symbolize regeneration and spiritual cleansing. Baptism is even called a circumcision done by Christ himself in Colossians 2, 11 and 12. In the Old Covenant, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, says Paul in Galatians 3, 16. And this seed is Jesus. So Jesus is the one who guarantees the covenant promises to us. And all of this is made clear in the coming of Jesus. As a sinless human being, Christ kept the terms of the covenant for us. And as a perfect sacrifice for sin, Jesus bore the penalty of the covenant curses for us. Therefore, we enter into the covenant uh, blessings through faith in Jesus, the one in whom all God's covenant promises receive their resounding yes. Baptism also constitutes entry into the church, the covenant community, which has Christ as its head. And Paul explicitly ties uh, baptism to the church in Ephesians 4, 4 to 6, where he says, there is one body, one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. Baptism is not so much a sign of our commitment to God, but of his commitment to us in Christ. Baptism is a sign and seal of God's promises to us. Promises guaranteed in Christ Jesus, who fulfilled all righteousness for us and stands in heaven to intercede for us. In faith, we present our children for baptism, claiming the promise of God, that he will be our God and the God of our children. We are claiming our children for him and to be his. It is required that those who present their children for baptism profess their faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and promise to bring up their children in that faith. It is required by our church that at least one parent should fulfill these conditions. And it is also the duty of the congregation to support in prayer and in every practical way all such parents and their children that they may have every opportunity to embrace Christ for themselves. Chris and Alex, if you want to join me at the front with Rebecca. Uh, Chris and Alex, I am now required to ask you uh, the following uh, questions. In presenting Rebecca for baptism, are you affirm affirming your belief in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? We are. And are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior from sin and as Lord of your life? We are. Depending on the grace of God, are you committed to living as a follower of Jesus Christ, led and empowered by the Holy Spirit? And are you willing to provide a Christian home and bring up Rebecca in the worship and teaching of the church so that she may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? We are. As we receive Rebecca into the fellowship of the church, do you promise, with God's help, to be faithful in prayer, spiritual nurture, Christian example and influence for her and her family? Okay, Rebecca Rose Irwin, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, we'll stand to sing the Aaronic Blessing. The Lord bless you. shine upon you and be great. 
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, we rejoice in this uh, new life, uh, Rebecca, that you have uh, given, Father, in your grace to Chris and Alex. Uh, Father, help them, we pray, to bring up Rebecca to know you, Father, and help us as a congregation to keep our promises, Father, that we have made and down through the years to all of the children who have been brought here, Father, that we will be an example and an influence to them, and Lord, give them every opportunity to embrace Christ for themselves. We pray again for our children, Father, that they will grow up to know you, to serve you, to love you, and to walk with you all the days of their lives. Father, we look to you to do this by your power. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you open your Bibles, please, to uh, John chapter 1, uh, verses 35 to 51. That's page 1064 in your Red Pew Bibles, 1064. And this is what the boys and girls are going to be looking at in Kids Zone later. So if you are a boy or girl in Kids Zone, listen up, because in this passage there are going to be some names or titles given to Jesus or referred to about Jesus. So listen up to the special names that Jesus is referred to, and I'll try and make those names clear with when we read it. John chapter 1, this is God's Word. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon, tell him, we found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here's a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Thank God for the reading of His Word. Boys and girls, do you want to come down for a chat and try not to topple this yoke over? Come on, lads, come and have a seat. All right, good morning, boys and girls. In our passage this morning, we heard a lot of names, okay? Names about people and names that people refer to Jesus by. This morning, we also heard a name of a baby who got baptized. We heard 
Rebecca Rose's name. And Rebecca Rose is called Rebecca Rose presumably because Chris and Alex like that name and maybe it means something important to them. You all have names given to you by presumably your parents because your parents like those names. Does anybody know what their names mean? Can anybody, what's your name mean? Son of Laughter on it. What's your name mean? Light, brilliant. So, Son of Laughter and Light, fantastic. Uh, my name is Scott, and my parents claim that they called me Scott because that was my great great grandmother's maiden name. But I also know there was a TV show at the time I was born, a very famous Australian TV show, in which Jason Donovan played a character called Scott. So, they can make up all they want, but I think I'm named after a TV character, okay? In today's passage, there were lots of names given to Jesus. Did anybody, did anybody hear any of the names people called Jesus by? Yeah. Pardon? Oh, yes. So, we heard about Andrew. Yes, one of Jesus' disciples. But so, so, Andrew and Philip and Simon and John, they all called Jesus certain things. Did you hear any of the things that they called Jesus? Yeah. They called him rabbi, which means teacher. Amazing. Pardon? Messiah, yes, fantastic. Any other ones? Yeah, yeah, Son of God, yeah. That was yours, yeah. So they called Jesus all these names. They called him Lamb of God, Messiah, Son of God. And these names are really, really important because these names tell us something about who Jesus is. You see, the Old Testament boys and girls, written years and years and years before Jesus, spoke of a lamb. It spoke of God's Messiah, which means God's special anointed king. And it said that God's special anointed king, the Messiah, the Son of God, would come and save God's people. And so when, boys and girls, these people called Jesus the Son of God, the Lamb of God, Messiah, the Christ, it tells us something special about Jesus. Jesus is God's promise to us come true. God promises us, boys and girls, that if we trust in Jesus and we believe in Jesus, if we turn from our sin and we turn towards Jesus, if we come and see, as the passage says, who Jesus really is, God will save us from our sins and give us life with Him. Jesus is the promised one, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the King. And when you and I trust in Jesus, God welcomes us into His big family. That's God's promises to to you and to me this morning. If you know and believe in Jesus as the Lamb of God who died on the cross to take away our sin, as the Son of God, the only one who could ever forgive us, as the Messiah, God's special King who rules and reigns and calls us to live for Him, if we believe in Him, He gives us life to the full and life forever with Him. You can have that this morning. We can all have that this morning when we turn from ourselves and turn towards Jesus in faith. Let's, Let's pray to Him now. Father, we thank You that Jesus... He's the Lamb of God, your special King, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. We thank you that on the cross He bled and died to forgive our sins and to make us right with Him. Father, would you help all of us to trust in Jesus this morning, to come and see Him for who He really is, to follow Him and to love Him. We pray all this in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. All right, so our song this morning is the big family of God, and I'm pretty sure there's some exciting actions that you can help us with if you fancy coming up onto the stage and standing up by Mark. <laughs> I'm going to stand up. Here we go.
All right, boys and girls, if you want to head out to Kid Zone. We have uh, a fair few announcements this morning. Um, next week is our, our harvest week, so um, there'll be two services next Sunday, Sunday morning uh, and Sunday evening. Um, can I encourage you to make an especial effort to come the next Sunday evening? We'll have people who were away on mission teams over the summer coming back and reporting about their experiences, what they got up to, what they saw God do in their lives in and through them over the summer. So next Sunday night, 7 o'clock. Um, for harvest setup, um, you can leave flowers and fruit and veg and things like that, decorations here on Friday between 7 and 8. And then uh, those will be arranged and organized on Saturday from 2 to 5. So leave off decorations next Friday night from 7 to 8. And then arrange decoration next Saturday from 2 to 5. Uh, there's no YF tonight. Uh, but a huge thanks to all the YFers, leaders, parents, uh, especially John Campbell, uh, for all the crack yesterday at Lurga Boy. Uh, it was a class day, um, as well as all the activities arranged. There was some amount of arm wrestling going along. Lucy Sturt uh, destroying the boys. It was great to see. Um, so we had a great time. Uh, remember our young people in a prayer, our prayer, your prayers. Uh, I think there was almost 50 uh, YFers there yesterday, so it was, it was class to see. Uh, small groups were announced last week. Uh, if you want to know more about small groups or if you didn't have an opportunity to sign up, um, there's information, I think, at the back. Um, or come and speak to myself. Um, we'd love to get you involved in, in small groups. Uh, there's a new one started up uh, in my house every other week. Um, so if you're new to the whole small group thing here, so am I. Feel free to join mine. Um, prayer and praise is on tonight, 7.30 in the hall. It's just that, prayer and praise. If you've never been, I'm on ahead, it's always a good time. And if you're not going to YF tonight, maybe come along to prayer and praise. Uh, we'd love to see you there. Um, our Alpha course continues to run on Thursday night in Ground Coffee Shop in the town center. Um, please keep that in your prayers. And it's not too late to come along. Um, no matter what week you start, you'll find the material is engaging. You'll be welcomed, no matter your belief, no matter your situation in life. Um, if you think Jesus is the king or you think Jesus is a fraud, uh, you're more than welcome to come along to Alpha on Thursday nights. Um, the latest edition of Release, Voice Inter or Release International Voice of Persecuted Christians is available at the back and at the coffee dock. And in that especially is the, the prayer information. Uh, so those are free for you to take. Um, please do take a copy. And remember our prayer time for our proposed church plant in the foyer Thursday nights at half nine. We're almost there. Uh, remember uh, uh, the podcast as well that Liam and I are doing three to four minutes in, as we work our way through the Sermon on the Mount. It's available on YouTube. Um, thanks for the feedback that has come our way about that. But it's on YouTube if you want to check that out. And finally, next or this Saturday night coming is our long awaited for every man's battle. Uh, the flyers are still available at the back. Um, if you are a man, please come along. It should be a really, really good night. Um, we have David Smith from the Evangelical Alliance coming along to talk about specific cultural challenges that men face in today's postmodern world. Um, that'll be really informative and, and really helpful for, for everybody, uh, regardless of who you are. Um, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions there as well. Please do come along to that. And then after that, Aaron Douglas will be speaking on biblical purity. And I've told, been told uh, by a few reputable sources that it's a really phenomenal presentation he, that he puts together. So men, sign up. Um, if you have a man in your life, force him out of the house next Saturday night. I, there is no, uh, Ireland are not playing in the Rugby World Cup next Saturday. I've checked, so there are no excuses. The only football on next Sunday, or next Saturday evening is Liverpool versus Tottenham. Who wants to watch that? Um, please come along. There will be, be food as well, so um, come along to that. We'll, uh, we'll take our offering now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are so generous and kind to us in everything that you provide for us, our, our health, our food, our shelter, our freedom, uh, our salvation. 
So as we give back to you what is yours, would you use it for your glory, we pray. So we reflect on your generosity. Would you stir up on us generous hearts? Father, we pray that you would use our gifts, our offerings to make your name known across this world. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And let's spend some time praying for others. Let's, let's pray again. Father, we thank you that you are a good God who loves to hear from us, that you love us to come and pray to you, and that you love to answer our prayers. Father, we thank you for the embarrassment of riches that we have in our church with our young people. Lord, we thank you that that is nothing to do with us and all because of your grace. And Father, we, um, we especially pray for those um, involved in our YF. Lord, thank you for the amount of young people you bring Sunday by Sunday. We thank you especially for those with no other church connection. And they are only here because our young people have invited them. So we thank you for the missionary hearts that you've given our teenagers, that they take the gospel seriously. Father, as they come Sunday by Sunday to YF and hopefully to church as well, Father, we pray that you would be raising up a generation of young people to love you and live for you. Father, would you give us the privilege of seeing teenagers with a vibrant faith that are a really active and vital part of our church's life. Lord, would this be a place where they are known and loved and cared for? Father, we pray for our youth leaders too. We especially pray this morning for our Sunday morning leaders. Say just to new spaces, uh, new children, new numbers. Lord, would you give them the energy and strength that they need? Would you help them to be able to love uh, our children well? And Father, would you help um, us as a church to take our baptismal vows seriously, to pray for our children, not just on Sunday mornings, but in our daily lives as well? Father, we long to see them come to know you and live for you. <coughs> Father, as we look out to the world, we, we see that there is mess and distress everywhere. Father, for the wars in Ukraine and Azerbaijan, Armenia, for the military coups going on in Africa, for things that our news has even given up reporting on and that we um, have forgotten about. Lord, we need you to bring your peace. Lord, we need your intervention. We need you to be with your people, and so we ask that. We pray, too, for places like Libya as they come to terms with devastation on an unprecedented scale. Father, we pray for the rescue and relief operation still going on there. Father, would your church in those places, where the church is small, would it be a big and bright light to the world around Father, for our time, we pray for change. Lord, we pray for the Alpha course on Thursday nights. We thank you for the number of people coming along from different backgrounds. Father, it's our prayer that they would come to know Jesus. It's our prayer that this time would be transformed by Jesus. That this time we'd love Jesus. Father, for those in our personal lives and in our church who cannot be here this morning, those who are sick, those who are lonely, those who are undergoing treatment. Father, would you draw near to them? Would they know your peace and your love in a special way? We pray all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Open your Bibles again to Acts chapter 14, uh, page 1109. jumping back into our series in Acts this morning. We're going to read the whole chapter. Acts 14, this is God's Word. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. 
there was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Darba and to the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the good news. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked at him directly, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw that what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who met heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, He let all nations go their own way, yet He has not left Himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But the disciples had gathered around him. He got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derbe. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them there to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and, with prayer and fasting, committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Attalia. From Attalia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how He had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Thank God for the reading of His Word. And as we come to learn from it and from Him, let's ask Him for His help. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that Your Word is living, it's active, it's true. Father, would You help us to believe it? to believe in you and believe you, be changed by you this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Are there any verses you read in the Bible? And if you're honest, you think, "Ah, I prefer if that wasn't in there. Like, life would be easier if that was removed. Maybe like Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies. That's hard. Or James 1, 19, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. That's hard. Our first Peter 2, 17 says, honor everyone. And then Peter goes on to make sure that we understand that that includes the government. We read that and we think, well, Peter wasn't from Northern Ireland. And then there's Acts 14, verse 22, which says this, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And the first reading of that verse, we probably think, does it really have to be like that? Is there there, there an opt-out button I can click and that I can avoid hardships and enter the kingdom of God? And actually, as you read through Acts 14, it's not necessarily something that you'd be expecting to hear on a missions feedback night like next Sunday night. Paul and Barnabas, they're out on this mission trip, their first great mission trip. And if they were to report back everything from Acts 14 next Sunday night, I think we'd probably turn around and say, we're not letting them go out again. They have people poisoned their minds against them. 
There's a failed plot to stone them. You have people trying to worship them instead of worshiping God, and then there's a successful plot to stone Paul. It's one hardship after another. It's brutal what some of these men went through. But when you read the second part of Acts 14, verse 22 in isolation, what you miss is what Paul and Barnabas are doing when they speak these words. Look at verse 22 in its entirety. They are strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. And so, these are actually, despite appearances, words of encouragement. These are words of encouragement. And later, when they return to Antioch, they're delighted to, verse 27, report all that God had done. Acts 14 is a strange chapter. It's a chapter of hardship, but at its heart, it's a chapter of encouragement. And it's encouraging us to do three things this morning, I believe. Three things. Number one, have a mindset of gospel confidence. Number two, know the reality of gospel care. And then number three, live with gospel courage. Have a mindset of gospel confidence, know the reality of gospel care, and live with gospel courage. Number one, have a mindset of gospel confidence. We can all think of a negative Nancy or a pessimistic Peter in our life, can't we? Those people, maybe we're those people, who are worst case scenario type people. The people that are presented with this lovely silver lining are looking for the cloud. The people who would walk around the Garden of Eden and manage to complain about the lack of mobile phone reception. If there was anyone who had the right to be like that in Acts 14, it's Paul and Barnabas, Paul especially. Look, look at verse 19 again. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. This is no light thing. I remember my four-year-old when he was a two-year-old, I assume naively, threw a stone and hit me on the head, and goodness, that pebble hurt. But Paul hasn't been attacked by a bunch of naive toddlers, but a mob of angry, bloodthirsty, full-grown men pelting him with rocks in order to kill him, to the point where they're convinced he's a goner. Take that incident in isolation. Can you imagine the trauma that would have caused him? And it's not just that in Acts 14, it's rejection after rejection. The bulk of Acts 14 details what we would say are negative experiences, hardships, extreme hardships even. And those hardships have to do with the whole human experience. You have that mental opposition as verse 2, Jews conspire to collude, to poison the minds of the Gentiles against the brothers. As verse 5, their opponents think up an evil plot. There's the spiritual opposition See that verse 13, as bulls are brought before Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas to be sacrificed to them. And then the physical opposition, that attempted murder in verse 19. But amidst these stories of opposition to the gospel that make up Acts 14, every so often we get a verse that changes the complexion of the chapter completely. Verse 1, there they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. Verse 4, some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. Verse 21, they preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. And in the end of verse 21, end of verse 22, Paul and Barnabas go back through the cities where they received this opposition to strengthen the disciples they've made. And it would appear that so many disciples have been made that there are an abundance of churches in which they have to appoint elders. And so we read in Acts 14 that despite everything, the hardships, the trials, the suffering, the insults, the lies, the slander, the misunderstanding, the, the heartbreak, the, the spiritual blindness, the physical ordeal of a stoning and all that comes with that, Verse 27, Paul and Barnabas reported all that God had done through them and how He had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. That is the picture Acts 14 sets out to paint. Despite the plethora of hardships that are awaiting those who love the Lord Jesus, Jesus wins. Jesus wins. 
Do you believe that this morning? Jesus wins. Paul and Barnabas, because they know that the gospel triumphs, they have this mindset of gospel confidence. We are called to share in that same mindset this morning. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, but enter the kingdom of God we will if we know and love Jesus. If you're here this morning and you love Jesus, do you ever feel worn out in your faith? Of course you do. Your heart will experience weightiness that feels unbearable at times, heaviness that's impossible to shake. Paul and Barnabas would have known those feelings well. And some would tell you that the fact that you have these hardships and these trials mean that your faith is weak or that you're not really a Christian. But people who say that do not know a Savior who suffered, a Savior who calls us to bear our crosses and follow Him. People who say that don't know Acts 14, verse 22. Your struggle in your faith is a sign, not that your faith is weak, but that it's alive and kicking. A faith in the gospel that wins no matter what no matter the hardships, no matter the trials, even in your darkest hour, Jesus wants to give you gospel confidence. And and it's not like happy, clappy, so-called hope based on absolutely nothing. It's rooted in Jesus. The same Jesus who was a victim not of an attempted murder, but a successful one, as He bled out on a Roman cross for you and me to deal with our sin, to deal with our darkness, to deal with our shame. And why should we have confidence in a man who died? Well, did He stay dead? No, He is risen, and He reigns, and He rules. He is the ultimate defeater of death. A Savior who intensely relates to our every hardship and trial a Savior who wants to give us confidence in Him. Do you know this Jesus today? He he is the only way you, you can have real lasting confidence and security in this life. Do you know Jesus today? You can, not you. And if you do know Jesus, that should change how we live. That should change our mindset. Paul, obviously, at some point, reported back all the details of Acts 14. That's why we can read all the details of Acts 14. The hardships, the struggle, the strife. But what is his priority when he gets back? Is it, here, listen to all that I went through? No, it's listen to all that God has done. That's gospel confidence in action. See, Christians should not be people who are quick to complain and seize on the negatives. There's enough people like that in the world. Christians should be people above everyone else who in every sphere of life have gospel confidence because our God and His gospel triumphs, because our Jesus wins. So, as you live life for Jesus, as you share the gospel with people who continually reject it? Do you have confidence that God can use even those interactions for His glory? As you suffer hardships, maybe that's being treated differently because you follow Jesus at work, at school, at home. Maybe it's even secondhand suffering as you watch loved ones who don't love Jesus make per life decisions. Do you know that you can still have gospel confidence in our God who takes death and brings forth life? A prayer we can all pray this week. Father, would you help us to live with gospel confidence in you and your gospel? Give us a mindset of confidence in your gospel in this world of darkness and hardship. God calls us to have confidence in Him. Let's do that together. Cynics might say, you're expecting Christians to live apart from reality. That's the problem with Christianity. It's not based in the real world. You're, you're, you're expecting people to have this airy, fairy, carefree attitude to life when life is hard. That's not the human experience. And I, I want to argue that's not the case. That brings us to our second point, that we can know the reality of gospel care. At no point 
in Acts 14? Does it say that Barnabas and Paul were left unscarred or unscathed by the experiences that they went through? Of course they weren't. And so God doesn't expect you to live apart from reality when it comes to your suffering in this world as a Christian. Know that. He's not indifferent. He cares. I'm sure Paul and Barnabas thought about these hardships often. I'm sure Paul was left with literal scars from rocks that hit his body that would have been a constant reminder throughout the rest of his life of the sufferings that he faced. He actually includes these sufferings, these experiences, when he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, detailing the many hardships that he experienced as an apostle. And he doesn't do so flippantly. He puts his experiences in context, yes, but it's clear for him they are real, they are felt, they are difficult. But look at what Paul and Barnabas do immediately after saying, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God to the new disciples that they're strengthening in the faith, new disciples that are following Jesus in a place where it's hard to follow Jesus. Verse 24, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they put their trust. This is an act of gospel care that we can and should know today. The fact that Paul and Barnabas appoint elders is an act of gospel care that we should all know and experience today. The thread of gospel care runs throughout Acts 14. Think of it this way. Paul and Barnabas are preaching the gospel, and what is the gospel? It is the good news that the God of this universe loves you so much that He gave His only Son to bleed and die for you and rise again so that He could meet your every need that He could care for you eternally in His Son, that you can have life in all its fullness with Him. The gospel is good news of God's care for you. And it's not just that, that God cares for His people, cares for His creation. Acts 14, 17, Paul points towards the common grace of God. He says this, He's shown you kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. God cares for all of His creation. But in Acts 14, verse 24, we see gospel care of God for His people in a special way, as Paul and Barnabas appoint elders. You see, according to Scripture, elders are not a board of trustees. They're not a board of directors. Stay clear from churches who talk solely about elders in that way. Elders are not businessmen whose job it is to, to make the church commercially and economically thrive and boom, to get bums and seats and peoples and programs, people and programs. Elders primarily are those who are responsible to care for you, to care for your souls, for your spiritual well-being, and they're answerable to God. 1 Timothy 3 verse 5 says that if an elder doesn't meet certain criteria, it asks this question, how then will he care for God's church? In other words, caring for the people in the church is the primary calling of an elder. Let me give you two other examples from Scripture. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. See that phrase, keeping watch? It's not like a hawk looking for a mouse, exercise control and power. It, it, it implies sleeplessness and vigilance, like a, like a night watchman of a city, keeping watch for those who might attack the city, or the, the city and do harm to its inhabitants. Think of the nurse on the night shift, keeping watch over the patient in their care. This is how an elder is to be, to have care for the people entrusted to them. Our First Peter 5 verse 2 says, elders, or to shepherd the flock that God is, that is among you, this just, sorry, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. And shepherding here alludes to 1 Peter 5 verse 4, the chief shepherd, that is Jesus, the one who cares deeply for us, empathizes with our every need, our hurt, our trial, the one who was willing to lay down his life for his sheep, but when God calls us to have gospel confidence, He never does so apart from gospel care. 
In his son, God has provided eternal care for your most pressing needs, a constant companion, a closest friend like no other. But Jesus' care for you is also found in his church. This is the system that Jesus himself has set up in which there are elders to care for you. That, that's his plan. That was his plan in Acts 14 for the people following Jesus and hard to follow Jesus' places. It's his plan now. I think that means a few things for us. We should get to know our elders. There's a notice board at the back. You'll see it on your way out with their lovely faces on them. They are good and godly men who love you and pray for you and take their responsibilities and roles seriously before God. I don't say that lightly. And there are many churches where I couldn't say that honestly. The reality is though, in a church this size, they can only pray for what they know. They pray for you. I have that privilege too, to pray for you. But if there are certain struggles, hardships in your life that you want prayed for, elders can't pray for those things unless they know about those things. Does that make sense? They can't specifically pray for your struggles if they're oblivious to your struggles. God has given us the men in this church as elders to care for us. We should make the most of that. We should be willing to approach them and talk to them and get to know them and share with them. It's their duty and privilege and honor before God to care for you. Flowing on from that is the reality that elders are only responsible actually responsible for those who are part of the church. That might sound harsh, but the reality is in Acts and the rest of the New Testament that elders weren't responsible for those just kind of affiliated to the church. Shepherds are responsible for their flock. Elders are responsible for their church. So, if you are a regular attendee here and you genuinely love the Lord and you're not a member, can I gently say, you are missing out on a tangible means of God's care for you. This is care that God desires you to have. God's good gospel plan for reaching this world and caring for His people involves elders. If there are no elders responsible for caring for you, you're, you're missing out, but you can change that. If you think that Bally Down is the place to find your spiritual home, have a chat with Liam or a chat to myself about becoming a member. Whether you've been here for a few weeks or a few months or whether you've been coming here a lifetime from a kid but you haven't made that commitment, make sure you're cared for. There are many hardships in this world that you will face as a believer in Jesus Christ. Don't go through them without the care that Jesus wants to give you. And also, we should pray for those who care for us and do so regularly and pray that God would raise up more godly men with character and capability and care that elders need. God provides us the reality of a special type of gospel care when we are His people through His Son and His church for which His Son died. And so we should have the mindset of gospel confidence. We should know the reality of gospel care. And then we should live with gospel courage. Live with gospel courage. The reality is that when we have the mindset of gospel confidence that Jesus wants us to have, and we know the reality of gospel care that Jesus provides for us, we are equipped to then go and live with gospel courage. Look at what Paul does after he was stoned, verse 20. He got back, he got up, and went back into the city. The city that stoned him. He got, back, got up and went back into the city that stoned him. And then what did he do? In another city, they preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. He did the thing that got him stoned. And then read on. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. He went back not only to where he was stoned, but where they also planned to stone him, where they were poisoned against him, where they mistakenly worshipped him. He had the mindset of gospel confidence. He knew the care of his God. And so he just did what he was called to do courageously. And we know from the rest of Acts, spoiler alert if you haven't read on, he goes again. This is only the first of three big missionary journeys. And more than that, in strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true in the faith, instilling gospel confidence in these new converts, and then appointing elders providing gospel care, he expected churches in these areas of great opposition to go and do the same. And they did. 
These churches grew and planted churches and reached people and made disciples. That is not easy to do. That is hard work. But it is one of the many hardships we must go through to enter the kingdom of God. It's our calling. One, one practical point to help us with this. As Paul went preaching the gospel in these cities that opposed him and strengthening the believers there, he already knew what people thought of him, didn't he? Like, they weren't fans, by and large. He knew that. Sometimes our biggest fear when it, when it comes to sharing the gospel is this, what will people think of me? What, what will people think of me? How will they react to me? We can often be so preoccupied with our selves and our own reputation. We take ourselves too seriously, and we don't take the gospel seriously enough. And the answer from Acts 14 is clear. What will people think of you? Some will think you're great. Others will think you're weird or strange or even evil. You can't control that. You can't control that. Some will oppose you. Some will get on board. Some in your work will oppose you, some will get on board. Some in your family will oppose you, some will get on board. But God cares for you, and God is with you. And so all you can do with a mindset of gospel confidence and knowing the reality of God's care for you is to courageously share the good news and live it out. Live it out. So make the most of the care that God gives you in this church. Get elders praying for you and caring for you. Remember that God loves to save people and does save people. And despite, as Romans 8 says, the tribulation and distress, famine, persecution, nakedness, danger, or sword in this life, hardship after hardship, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So talk to those who reject the gospel and do so expectantly. Know that God works, that the gospel triumphs, that Jesus wins, He cares for you, and He calls you to live with courage. Let's do that together. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that Your Word tells us and shows us that we can have great confidence in our Savior Jesus Christ who wins and His gospel that triumphs. Father, would You help us to know the care that we have from You both How you, how you meet our need, how you atone for our sin, and also how you provide people in this church specifically to love and care for us. And Father, when we know those things, would you help us to live for you, even when it's hard, especially when it's hard? Knowing that you are good, that you are glorious, that Jesus is triumphant. We pray this in his name. Amen. So, Ban, uh, come to lead us in our final song of praise. Can I remind you that there is prayer ministry over by the big window? If there's anything you want prayer for, pray for it. If you do want to become a member here at Bally Down, please do have that conversation. And if you are here this morning and you don't yet know and love Jesus, can I encourage you, don't leave this place without having a conversation with someone who does. Our last song is O Church Arise, if you'd like to stand. Church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and bolts of truth, we'll stand against the devil.
the Son of God is stricken, then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet, for the conqueror has risen. I just remind you, uh, next Friday night, if you have harvest decorations, bring them between 7 and 8, and then the setup is next Saturday between 2 and 5, and hopefully see uh, many of you back here tonight for prayer and praise. Let's say the, the benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.